Welcome back to the Quantum Yoga Podcast. Today, we have Don Estes, who's the CEO and director of Inner Sense and Psyometric Science. He has also created a, a very interesting, uh, for lack of a better word, sort of future physics, if you will, or integrative physics and which sort of underpins the technologies that he's developed and some of the patents that he holds. And uh, this is going to be a, a great mind stretching conversation. Uh, welcome to the program, Don. Mm, my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Rather than give a long biography or autobiography uh, of your history, I, maybe we could start in with the math the physics, this, the science of the underpinning of your technology. Can we just jump right in there? Are you okay with that? Or do you need to preface with something? Sometimes it helps people to understand how it all came about, but um, I'm willing to go wherever you want to go with it. If you want to jump right in, we can leap in. I, I do, because you were just talking about how you condensed 15 years of research into a, basically a symbol, right? And then when you tried to give a lecture on that, it took you 12 hours to get through most of it. And we got one. So I would love to hear about that. And that's sort of what you're showing behind you and up above. That yeah, up above here behind my yeah. head there is... Uh, is a wall chart called the absolute scale of relative cosmic reality and um do we want to share that now or do you want to just keep uh the video going yeah I, up to you up to you okay so let me just since you were talking about that let me let me go to it here where we can see it so yes this is what you're talking about the uh a wall chart that I call the absolute scale of relative cosmic reality. And basically what it is, is it is a master illustration for a book that I wrote back at uh, the turn of the century. <laughs> it's funny to say that. Sounds like it's so long ago. Um, but back in 99, uh, I wrote a book called Harmonic Law, the Science of Vibration. And um, as I was trying to illustrate that book, one night I was sitting in the living room floor and I had about 40 little illustrations all scattered out around me trying to get them into the book in the right place. And uh, it was almost like I woke up from a dream and I found myself sitting there on the floor with these images scattered around me and it appeared that they were scattered out as sort of a spoke kind of a, a, a arrangement to where I was sort of the center of the hub and I had all these pictures spread out around me and I thought I didn't remember laying them out really like that and so I stood up and I looked down on them and the second that I looked down on them, I saw this in my mind's eye I just kind of saw how it all fit together as a cycle rather than as a linear thing because up until these uh, this time um the uh, the spectrum this vibrational spectrum had been kind of seen like this it can kind of seem like a linear kind of arrangement to where you have uh, slower frequencies down here and faster frequencies up here. Uh, and you've seen this many times before where you see it banded off into the different bands. Here, the, here's the visible light range. And then as you slow down, there's infrared and then microwaves and radar and radio and broadcast band. And as you go up, you get into ultraviolet and X-rays and gamma rays. But all my life, I've been really curious about this particular layout because it did not seem reasonable to me that the universe would just chop things off at both ends like this and have it just kind of disappear. And I've always wondered why that was. And when I finally put this all together and realized that the two ends of that wrap back together and it makes a cycle rather than a linear uh, display, then um, I created this chart that basically shows that. It shows how the linearity of this from end to end, how these two ends here are wrapped back together up at the top of this chart. And um, 
then I became extremely interested, almost obsessed with how does this thing end at both ends? What, what terminates mm-hmm. the vibrational spectrum at, at both ends? And um, that's how this all got started was the research into how the uh, vibrational spectrum begins and ends. And that's how all of the technology came about. So that really is the most interesting point. And what what'd you come up with? <laughs> I, I'm curious myself. Well, there are uh, there are a number of ways of looking at it. Actually, the uh, you can you can assign a lot of different kinds of designations to both of those ends. The the standard model basically now says that the vibrational spectrum starts at the quantum. So that would be here on my chart with this little spot right here, which would be the fastest frequency, the, the, um, the most narrow wavelength, the shortest amount of time. But then as you begin to increase that and follow the, the scale around to the other end, it actually ends in the quantum in the gravity constant, and this is the big thing in physics right now is is that scientists are trying to figure out uh, how these two things relate to each other. They know the math of the quantum worlds doesn't really match up to the math of the gravity worlds, and so everybody's working on this unified theory to show how these two relate to each other because it's obvious that somehow that they do. But it's even more obvious when you lay it out like this in a cycle to where you can see that they're almost against each other on this scale. And to how do those things uh, resolve each other, relate to each other? Well, most of the scientists are using technologies and using methods and using math that tries to connect the two through the relative parts of the scale, which is all of this part down here, which this is basically everything that we know starting at force that turns into elementary particles that become atoms that come together to create molecules that combine to create cells and then tissues and then organs and then organisms and then superorganisms like humans. Everything that we we know falls into this relative scale that's all relative by frequency. So you have the fastest frequencies up here and the slowest frequencies down here. So most of the scientists are trying to relate the two through the relative worlds. However, as you can see here on my chart, there's another way of of showing how these things relate, and that's at the end where they actually come together. And this is the area up in here that I call the absolute nature of reality as opposed to the relative nature of reality. And I have found that it's much easier to bring these two things together up here in the absolute worlds uh, much easier than it is to relate them together in the relative worlds of frequencies and vibrations. So um, we could really we could talk for a long time about the difference between absolute reality and relative reality. But to talk about absolute reality, you have to talk about archetypes and origins and destinies and things like that that a lot of scientists don't really don't want to talk about and. I mean, sooner or later, it leads you into talking about first cause and things like God and things like that that a lot of of uh, scientists don't really like to talk about. So pretty much science is stuck in this relative world down here, whereas religion is kind of stuck in this absolute world up here. And this chart, I believe, begins to kind of show how those two relate to each other, how the relative worlds, relative reality, proceeds out of absolute reality. How does all this appear? Where does it all go to? That was the purpose of the creation of the chart. I'd like to ask about some other elements of fringe physics that people talk about and uh, we've, we've covered in the podcast and maybe you're aware of this and maybe you could even point to where it fits in in your model. So there's the, there's the electric universe theory and is that something that you're familiar with? Sure. Yeah. Does it, d- how how does that fit into your model, or does it? Is it not work? Mm, 
Well, it fits in. Uh, electricity is just one uh, one of the forces out there. You know, they say they're the, the four forces of uh, uh, electromagnetism, gravity, the strong force, and the weak force. Um, what I learned from actually putting this chart together is that you can look at reality from an entirely different uh, standpoint to where you you see it and instead of seeing it like this as the order of it, you can see it as the chaos of it. And um, we've been able to really show how those four forces of standard physics are really just what are called attractors in the chaos theory. So we have, there's the point attractor and the line attractor and the toroidal attractor and the strange attractor. And those attractors are actually pulling things together and creating order out of chaos. And so uh, electromagnetism and electricity are just really one of the aspects of reality. And I think that um, a lot of people get confused because on this side of the quantum veil, over here in the relative worlds, everything is relative by frequency. It's a vibration. Everybody. Uh, everybody is pretty much aware of the fact that everything that we know is a vibration. But that's only true over here on this side of the quantum veil in what we call direct space, the, the time space that we live in. Everything is relative by frequency. But on the other side, in the absolute world, this is DC. It's not AC. It's just on all the time. There's no vibration. It's just on all the time. And over here, these same vibrations that wind up being vibrations over here, over here on the other side, they're actually just patterns, ratios of numbers that uh, intention has the ability to reach across this veil and bring together all of those different uh, uh, aspects that lead to reality and bring them across over here to the other side, in which case they, they turn into frequencies and vibrations. One of our greatest discoveries was that over here on the vibrational side, everything is relative by vibration. If you start looking at those vibrations, you find that they're mixtures of sines and cosine waves. But over here on the other side, those sine waves and cosine waves are called real and imaginary components. And they're basically, they relate to the actual parts of something versus the potential parts of something. So um, intention, as I mentioned, has the ability to reach across this veil and consider the actual and the potential parts of something and combine them together. And when they do, when it does, sine waves and cosines appear on this side. And we have all of the strings from string theory and cosmic strings and all those theories that develop from how our world, how things get manifest. How does a thought that starts over here in the absolute worlds, how does that manifest itself over here in the time domain that we live in? Yeah, and one of the uh, sort of a prevailing way to talk about consciousness is um, in a dual and non-dual way, especially when you're looking at you're looking at uh, experiences like transcendental experiences. Uh, I would a non-dual way of looking at this be that ability to sort of experience both the real and the imaginary simultaneously. Exactly. They, they, they come together. Consciousness has the ability to bring together the potential parts of something and the actual parts of something and that it, it appears over here in the real world. In your model, do you see time as a single linear event that's kind of collapsing into form? And I guess I'm asking this because previously I, I interviewed Julie Mossbridge and her, a lot of her research, and you know her well, a lot of her research is uh, that essentially precognition is based on future time and accessing future time. And so can well, you yeah, reconcile that? Yeah, that's a really interesting, interesting thing. In fact, I, I have a whole other workshop that I give on this where we just reduce it all back down to time. If you were to be able to zoom in on this, you would see that one of the scales here, you see there's a number of different 
uh, elliptical scales here. One of these is just frequency and music and that sort of thing, but there's actually 25 different relative scales that are on this chart. And one of these scales is time. So if you could zoom in on this and follow this line right here, you would go all the way back through time. Here's all the different major things that have happened on the planet and that sort of thing back through time. But what I discovered from looking at this is that if you look at this from the standpoint of time and you come all the way back down to the present moment, which is somewhere along in here, you can't, I can't zoom in on it for you to see, but these are all the different designations of, um, of brain waves down here, starting with uh, uh, sub delta and delta, theta, uh, alpha, beta, and gamma. And uh, down in here somewhere is something like one cycle per second. And the brain waves are a little bit more than that, from from a little bit, uh, some from around one hertz up to uh, uh, they say 40 hertz, even though we know now it goes a lot further than that. But looking at that, I suddenly realized that um, the way this whole thing about time works is, is that we use telescopes to look into space. We look in this way into space with a telescope. And we know that we're looking into the past, right? Because they say, well, that star is 100 million light years away or five light years away or whatever. We don't talk too much about the fact that when we're standing in the room with somebody talking to them, we're seeing them in the room with us, but we're not really seeing them in real time. We're seeing them three tenths of a second before then. Wow, that is. And um, that's my and, first mind stretch right there, Don. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And um, what's even stranger than that is that when you turn this around the other way and start thinking about it, you realize that microscopes actually allow us to look into the future. Because most people think that the future is stretched out in front of us, just like the past is stretched out behind us. But it's really not. If I were to ask you to tell me when does the next moment start, you would be trying to tell me. So it starts right here, starts right here. But you couldn't do it fast enough. Because in all actuality, the next moment starts up here on my chart at the quantum, which is something like 10 to the minus 44th of a second. Mm. Well, that's a, that's a, that leads me to a, a thought that maybe this is tangential. We can, we can bookmark it for later. But when a, when a person is in a timeless awareness state and they are fully, fully, we'll say fully in the present moment, unaware of any other time, part of their consciousness is located up there at the top of your chart. Yeah, that'd be a, that's a good way of, of looking at it. And you, you can get off into all kinds of uh, ways of looking at this once you, you start getting into the details. But uh, it's interesting because you can see from this how it is that we create our own reality. Because when you have a thought, that thought starts right here at the beginning of the next moment. But you don't realize that that thought has even occurred until it gets all the way back down here to the frequencies of brain waves, because where our brain is turning on and off in a, in a normal state, somewhere around 10 to 12, 14 cycles per second. And so what that means is, is that when you have a thought, something like a tenth of a second goes by before you even realize that you've had the thought. But in that tenth of a second, all of these other parts of you, all of the forces and the elementary particles and the atoms and the molecules and the cells and the tissues, all of that that makes you up gets the information before you do. And so it's easy to see that if you reduce it all the way back down to an electron, the electrons that make you up, for example, they are turning on and off so fast that literally thousands of years in their own time span goes by before you even recognize that you had the thought. So all these parts of you that make you up get the information beforehand and they start living and dying and living and dying and trying to, um, trying to um, uh, bring this thought um, uh, into your awareness that's a tenth of a second away, 
but you can see how they have so much time to change themselves, modify themselves, transform themselves before you even recognize that you, you had the thought. So th to me, that basically explains how it is that we more or less create our own reality because all of these parts of us that make us up are actually moving so much faster than we are. And they, they get the information way sooner than, than we do. So again, I say that when we take a microscope, we're looking this way into the future. Oops, the future is uh, not, um, the future is not, um, where am I? Come on here. There we go. Um, so the future is not stretched out in front of us like the past has stretched behind us. It's actually um, right there in front of us, only like 10 to the minus 44th of a second away. And we use microscopes to look at that part of ourselves. We use telescopes to see into the past. And so, yeah, to answer your question, looking at it from a cycle standpoint like this is that you can get a very clear understanding about how time actually works. We're, we're down here in this present moment. Um, but if you speed up, you, you go into the future. When you slow down, you go into the past. And I actually proved this by doing um, brainwave studies on uh, uh, fighters, uh, wrestlers and fighters. If you, if you go and you do a, um, a good example was a, a person that, we, that was a world famous fighter that uh, we did brainwaves before the fight. They call this person uh, Mr. Slow Motion. And when they ask him, why do they call you Mr. Slow Motion? He says that when he's having a fight with someone, he says, it looks like everybody else is moving in slow motion. And what I realized from that is, is that when you speed your vibrations up, when you speed your thought process, processes up and you move this way into the future, you're not really moving into the future because the future is really up here. But the next moment is right there. And so you don't really move into somebody else's future, but you move more into the future than they are because they're kind of stuck back here. Wow. So, so actually what I, what I think you're saying or what I hear you saying is that what we are sensing as the future is actually the past because exactly. we're, <laughs> oh my God, it's actually the past because the, the present moment occurred before, before all of that. So you're in a way, you're just basically, so are you, are you saying then that these fighters are modulating their nervous system in a way in their sensory perception in a way to speed it up exactly so when we did brain waves on the competitor his average brain wave was um, i think it was around 15 or 16 or something like that whereas this other fighter his brain waves were up around 60 hertz and so what that means is that every second that went by the the person moving faster had three moments of reality to the other guy's one moment and so it looks like to the to the person that's moving faster it looks like the other person's moving in slow motion and a lot of us have experienced that before i'm sure you've been um you've had experiences like a car accident or something like that to where you suddenly get thrown into this um uh this uh a big challenge with a with a accident or something like that and you're watching the glass kind of float by your face every kind of kind of thing slows down a little bit because you actually sped up does that make sense absolutely i'm just trying <laughs> i'm just i'm just so compelled by it i'm i'm uh yeah i'm actually going a little slower than you're talking right now because of it so <laughs> So this is so interesting because gamma is really where a lot of the neuroscience study is going, especially in regard to, to meditators. And some of these ecstatic experiences are really happening on a very fast brainwave level. And you, you have been, oh, great, you're pulling this up. Excellent. 
can you talk more about this? Yeah, so if you look at um, the human autonomic nervous system, this is sort of an expanded model of that, where the standard model says that we have homeostasis in the middle and you speed up into the sympathetic fight or flight response or you slow down into the parasympathetic relaxation response. Uh, but the truth is, is that if you, if you have to go either way, you have to make a decision as to what is causing that change. So if you're, if you're in homeostasis here in the middle and you start increasing in your frequency, you move into what they call the sympathetic response, which most scientists will call the fight or flight syndrome. But that's not totally true because we're aware of other situations where the person is not in fight and flight, like you heard of the so-called uh, runner's high or the, um, the athletic high that where you get in the bliss and ecstasy moments when you're, when you're sped up like that into uh, a game or something, uh, something else that's not causing you threat. So the idea is, is that either way you go, you have to decide, is this thing that's happening to me, is it a threat or is it a challenge? And if you choose threat, you go into dissonance. If you choose challenge, you go into resonance. So I have the whole autonomic nervous system split up into two different aspects to where if you, if you see it as a challenge, you go into sympathetic resonance, which is profound exhilaration and inspiration and feelings of joy and peace and a sense of well-being, sense of being connected to everything, bliss, ecstasy, and those, those sorts of things. Whereas if you see it as a threat, you're going to go into the sympathetic dissonance, which is uh, the fight or flight syndrome of fear, anxiety, worry, uh, anger, hurt, and all those kinds of things that we're familiar with. But the same thing happens if you go the other way. If you go into the parasympathetic um, um, mode, uh, you again, you have to decide, is this a challenge or is it a threat? And usually it's a threat. People usually go to sleep and everything because they need to get away from things. They need to rejuvenate. So you go into this parasympathetic uh, mode and uh, you go to sleep. But the problem with that is if that gets overdone, then you go into these states to where you're bored and understimulated and ungaged and guilty and frustrated and all those kind of things. In fact, this sort of thing leads to criminal behavior to where a person in order to uh, in order to feel stimulated, they actually have to um, uh, go out and rob a bank or something like that uh, or hurt somebody or kill somebody or something like that. However, if you choose, if you go into parasympathetic and you choose challenge, you go into what we call parasympathetic resonance, which is the true relaxation response that leads to profound relaxation without going to sleep, our wisdom and patience and purpose and connection with one's higher self. So basically, you wind up self-realized over here and self-mastered over here. But this is only if you're choosing challenge over the threat. Is there a way to to uh, quantify resonance dissonance within the standard measurements of the nervous system, EEG or GSR, heart yeah, rate variability. All, yeah, all of those things measure that. So they do, because I, I mean, the way I'm seeing this is if we're talking about frequency, you know, we're not able to see this this slight dissonance resonance quality that you're talking about. I mean, we can see arousal level by frequency, right? But we can't necessarily see this particular quality that you're designating. That's or am, very, I, am I incorrect there? Yeah, no, you're correct. Uh, we tested this out by um, going outside and sitting three chairs outside. And in one chair, we would put a, uh, a trained yogi who basically has learned how to shunt uh, uh, gamma and, and beta and all that, and they go deep and deep into delta and sub-delta. And in the next year, we have a Zen master who has a different approach to uh, uh, relaxation. And um, uh, the third chair would be a 
type A salesperson that's already late to his next meeting. So you set them all down in these chairs and you, you hook them up to technology like you're talking about so that you can actually see what's happening with their nervous system. And then you ask them to relax. And they all get as relaxed as they can. Maybe you're playing some music or whatever and, and helping them relax. And you can see from the, from the technology that they're all beginning to relax a little bit. And then somewhere along the line there, you take a shotgun without telling them and you just blast it into the ground behind them. And then you watch the, the data to see what's happening. And what you find is, is that the, the yogi who goes deep, deep into Delta has no evoked response. They're not even aware that you just fired off a gun. They just stay deep. Whereas both the Zen master and the type A person immediately zoom up to maximum stimulation. But the interesting thing is, is that immediately the Zen master begins to reduce all of those frequencies back down to this relaxed state. Whereas the type A salesperson never recovers from the, the stimulation. So what we determined from that is that Zen mastery is a much better life coping tool than yogic, um, the yogic approach, because it allows you to be in the world, but not of it. It allows you to be extremely relaxed, uh, and but extremely alert at the same time. So most of our technology is based around how do, how do we help a person get into that state of mind to where they can be extremely relaxed and extremely alert at the same time. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess you, I guess you could use, I guess you could use coherence and incoherence on a brain map as a potential way to denote resonance if it was, if it was in, um, because for example, you know, there's a, a quite a few studies done on, uh, Tibetan monks that are doing meta loving kindness meditations and they exhibit high levels of gamma gamma synchrony and so it's that sort of synchrony that I would suppose would be something like resonance right you if you were exhibiting that that would be kind of close to this Zen part uh, part anyways of the Zen component yeah that's right okay all right great Wow, that is fascinating. That is fascinating. So, where were we? We were uh, we were at <laughs> we were at the chart, uh, maybe before I went off on that. Yeah, we were over here looking at the chart a bit. It might be helpful for everybody to um, for me to show. Um, let me see if I have. Uh, Here we go. So these are, um, this is the Michael structure of a wave. And um, most people in our industry are really hung up about frequency. Frequency this, frequency that, everything's a vibration according to frequency. But actually signals, waves have properties other than frequency that are as, as important if not more important. So here you can see in this diagram, that the frequency is shown as the number of waves per time period. So you have a three second time period and you have three waves in here. So that would relate to one cycle per one second. So we would be looking here at one Hertz or one cycle per one second, but that's just the frequency of it. There's also the magnitude of it, which is the volume of the wave. And there's also something that's even more important called the phase, which is the relationships between the peaks of the waves. And what we've discovered is that it's this phase where the information is, the frequency is basically just a carrier wave. It, the frequency has to be the same between a, a generator and a receiver or a transmitter and a receiver. They have to be on the same frequency so that they can communicate with each other. But the actual information is on the phase. And the amplitude, as a Manfred Kleins has shown, is on the amplitude envelope. So we actually have three different things going on here. We have the frequency, the phase, and the amplitude that are showing 
um, how the two can communicate with other, but also is carrying this information on the phase and carrying the emotion on the amplitude. So when you talk about um, resonance and the coherence and stuff, you have to look at all of these factors, not just frequency. And then when you, when you start breaking this down, um, see if I can go back to where you can see the whole slide here. All of our technology came from studying this wave equation that defines waves. And that wave equation says that the complex wave equals the real times the cosine times the frequency plus the imaginary times the sine waves times the frequency. And you can go online and you can do a search for sine wave and cosine wave and you get thousands or hundreds of thousands of hits. They even tried to teach us a little bit about this in high school in trigonometry. Unfortunately, they didn't teach us that it had anything to do with waves. They taught us what it had to do with right triangles and hypotenuse and tangent and all that and how to figure out mathematical equations from it. They didn't really teach us what it had to do with waves, even though it's called sine wave and cosine wave. But if you go online and you do a search for real and imaginary, you don't really get very much. And so we became obsessed with what are these real and imaginary components? Because they know, science knows that it's these two components that creates this phase. And so in studying this, we went to all the experts and asked, what are these two things? And the best that you can get in from anybody is that they are mathematical functions that are required to solve the wave equation. But that was not enough for us. We wanted to know, what are they? Where do they originate from? Where do they come from? And no one really could answer that question. So for 20 years, we've been studying this. What are these real and imaginary components? And even though what I'm about to say is a, uh, a simplification of it, and it's not quite this simple, but at the basic, line, at the basic level of it, what we find is, is that this real component is called the time component, and this imaginary component is called the spectral component. So it doesn't take a lot of uh, genius to figure out that this one is coming from time and this one is coming from the spectra. So if you back off of it and you look at it a little bit, make an example out of it, let's say that we're listening to someone play a violin, for example, and the wave that you're hearing is, is determined by this equation right here. Part of what you're hearing is coming from the instrument itself, from the resonant cavities of the instrument. Uh, and it always sounds like that instrument, no matter who plays it, an expert could listen to 10 different people playing a violin and they could say, yeah, that's the same, that's the same violin because it has its own tone. But how it's being played is something totally different. So the bottom line of it is, is that, and again, this is a simplification, but it comes down to the fact that this real component is coming from the player, whereas this imaginary component, component is coming from the instrument. And you can see from uh, observation that whenever those two components are better integrated, the outcome is better. So whenever a, a player is more integrated with an instrument, the music is more beautiful. Or you can look at it different. You could look at it as a, an operator in a machine. Whenever an operator is more integrated with a machine, the, um, the better the machine performs, it has less breakdown and that sort of thing. Same thing is true of a driver in a vehicle. Whenever there's a, a better connection there, the outcome is better. So the same thing is true in us. In fact, we finally came to the conclusion that this is the source of all human suffering, is this difference between the player and the instrument. So all of our technology was designed around how do we better uh, integrate a player with an instrument. And once that, once that gets better integrated, the outcome is better. So a person's music or their life actually becomes much better when they're more integrated. So all of our technologies, from our sensory technologies to our um, uh, biofeedback technologies, all are based around this. How do we better integrate a person's player component 
uh, with their instrument. I love that. And another, maybe another way of saying this too, is to talk about it uh, with harmonics right because you are you're looking at multiple frequencies well that's an interesting thing too because you what you're talking about is a complex wave a single wave is just one of these waves like a uh one hertz for example is a sine wave that doesn't have a lot of other that has no other waves on it. it's just a single wave like this but a complex wave is different um let me see if i have a i don't think I have a um, I'll have a slide that basically explains that um, in here. But if you if you start stacking other waves on top of this sine wave, you actually change the shape of it, and uh, so you can turn this into a square wave or a triangle wave or any any kind of complex wave from an instrument and that sort of thing. So um, let's see. What was your question? Well, it was, it, it, and I'm, I've heard you use that term before, harmonics. And another way of, uh, I was just kind of seeing another way of looking at uh, resonance versus dissonance is harmony or in harmony or disharmony in, oh, within yeah. a person, and within yeah. it's sort of the full integration of consciousness, the body, the field of the fields of the body all operating orchestrated in an integrated way in a harmonic way yeah this is uh, another thing that's not very well known uh, within the the industry right now is that you can actually change the shape of a wave without changing its frequencies and uh, this is something that uh, can lead us off into a whole other uh, uh, a whole nother workshop basically to explain how that basically can happen. But uh, if we were to take a white sound, for example, which is uh, thousands of frequencies all playing at the same time, and we put all of their phases out of phase with each other to where each one of the waves are at a different phase, and then you play that through a speaker, it sounds like an ocean wave or it sounds like a waterfall. But if I take that same set of frequencies and I put all of the frequencies in phase with each other, I've, I've got the same exact frequencies, but now instead of sounding like a waterfall, they sound like a gunshot. And so we have a lot of different ways of proving that the information is basically traveling on the phase and the shape of the wave and not necessarily on the frequencies whereas pretty much everybody in the industry is still hung up about this idea about how everything has a frequency. But even if you did know the frequency of a human heart, which is um, uh, dependent on the person, a baby's heart, of course, doesn't have the same frequency as a large uh, adult male's heart. But even if you knew the frequency of a heart, and you use a frequency generator to stimulate that, and you generate that frequency, uh, into the heart. Um, if you're using just a standard um, wave shape, like a sine wave or a square wave or a triangle wave or something like that, you basically don't have any information on it. You're basically communicating with the heart, but you're just saying blah, blah, blah to it. Mm -hmm. You're not really communicating any information. So these, this idea of the complex wave creating the shape of the wave is really where all of the information is. Yeah, that reminds me of when I interviewed Roland uh, from HeartMath. He was, a, he was saying something similar there. They can simply look at the waveform and tell with a high degree of accuracy someone's emotional tone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's, this is going to be the next big thing in our industry is looking at the shapes of the waves instead of so much just the frequency of them. Let's, let's transition now and start talking about the tables and some of the, the technology that's come out of this science. It's fascinating, and I, because I do a lot of biofeedback and neurofeedback in my clinic, this is next level feedback. Sure. Um, 
This is something that I created, honestly, back in the 60s when I was in college. And we were, um, in those days, we were, this was back before they made psychedelics illegal. And uh, we were actually just making them in the chemistry laboratory and um, having a really wonderful time with them. No one that I ever knew had a bad trip or anything like that. It was all beautiful and wonderful and our minds were being expanded. But then they made it illegal and everybody started cutting it with strychnine and everybody started having bad trips and all of the bad press and everything about it. Then they made it illegal and, and everybody kind of lost touch with it. But um, I sort of loved it. In fact, I, I wanted to kind of live there. But the problem was that um, uh, there's a compensatory lag time when you get to one of these altered states by popping a pill. So you feel great for a few minutes, and then the next day you don't feel so good. And so I dedicated my life to coming up with a way of how do I create an altered state how do I create a non-ordinary state like that without having to pop a pill? And the first thing that I noticed was when we started researching this is that the first thing people do when they do a psychedelic is, is that they, they change their environment. They put on a bunch of colored lights or a black light. They improve their environment. So we got started there. The name of my company was originally Innersense Environments, and it was about changing the environment to shift a person's state of mind. But then that all kind of got personalized when we started realizing that we could make personal experiences like that and shift a person's environment inside. And so I created this device called Vibrasound, which is sort of like a table uh, with a fluid mattress on it. Now this, it's not really water in here. This is a, a, um, a colloidal mineral suspension that behaves very similar to the way human tissue fluid behaves with regards to sound. So you lie down on this mattress and there's no impedance loss between your body and this mattress. So it feels like it's coming right out. If you play music or sound through it, it feels like it's coming right out of your body rather than like you're laying on something that's vibrating. So this device has some electrophysical transducers involved in it that actually convert sound into physical vibration. So the idea would be that the person would lie down on this table and you could play music or you could play frequencies or you could play their brain waves or whatever the signal might be directly into their body. And at the same time, we began to grow this and realized, I showed you earlier this, um, this theory that I put forth about sensory resonance and how uh, the more sensory mechanisms that you can get involved into the experience, the more profound that it is. And I basically came to this conclusion that there's a pharmacy inside our brains and we're the pharmacist. We can write a prescription to feel any way we want to feel, but most people won't do that. Most people will let somebody else or some situation that they're in write the prescription for them. So I wanted to give them a technology of learning how to become the pharmacist and, and write their own prescriptions. So that's what we came up with this technology called Vibrasound, that the person lies down on the, and they feel the information coming directly into their body. But at the same time, with other technology, we, can, we allow them to see it and to hear it as well. So we have, if you have your eyes open, you have a screen that you're looking at projected onto the ceiling to where you're watching 3D virtual reality. So you could be swimming with dolphins in 3D or flying through Mayan pyramids or whatever it might be. But if you close your eyes, this other device takes over a little plate that's, fly, that's floating over your eyes that basically plays the frequencies that you're listening and, and feeling, plays that directly into your eyes as a, um, a pulsed light so that you're seeing the same thing that you're feeling. And then wearing earphones and running that through a super um, processor system, you basically have all three main sensory mechanisms involved in the experience of the person is seeing, hearing, and feeling the signal at the same time. So um, this technology has grown, uh, and this was the first uh, version of it. Now we're in our 13th generation of it. And um, so the technology has grown quite a bit. 
and we had this available not only in this vibrasound wavetable form, but we also have it in a, um, a zero gravity chair, like a reclining chair form or a massage table form. Or even most recently, we have now just a little pad that goes into any chair that allows a person to feel the music. And our latest, um, our latest technology is uh, a way of controlling that with uh, what we call the sensorium uh, light and sound and vibration sensory interface um, that allows us to um, probe aspects of an experience with the vibra sound so that um, basically this system here will generate synchronize and program any known vibrational phenomenon so it will generate flashing lights it will generate colors it will generate sounds it will generate music it will generate tactile vibrations it will generate electromagnetic fields or pulsed um, uh, pulse plasma tube fields or anything that is vibrational this system can actually generate that and then synchronize and program it so i could go in there's 107 different parameters here that are controllable i could go in and set 107 different parameters and say for 30 seconds whoops for 30 seconds um, oh come on now uh, for 30 seconds i wanted to do all of these things and then i want at the end of 30 seconds i wanted to switch over and do another 107 things so i could stack these sequences one after the other and make an hour long program such that it goes through a series of doing different kinds of lights and different kinds of colors and different kinds of vibrations and sound and music uh, all synchronized and programmed together so that all i have to do is hit the run button and then i can walk away from it and what makes this a feedback device how is that working that component well, that is a that's a totally different thing if we go over here to um let me get another keynote up here where i can show you this here we go so this is our uh, our latest technology for biofeedback called the portical tell you what let me just pull up the real system since i've got you shared here so you can actually see it in real time so um, this is a system that basically allows us to take a person's expressions, what they're saying or what they're thinking. If we're using a headband, we can use their brain waves instead. But this system allows us to take what a person is expressing and separate it into those real and imaginary components that I was mis mentioning earlier. So it basically starts out right here as the, what we call the portical. And if I be quiet for a second, you'll see how this thing will settle down. But as I start speaking, you can see it's actually responding to my voice. And so what we're doing here is we're actually taking the signal in and we're separating the real and the imaginary to where this horizontal plane is the real plane and this vertical plane is the imaginary plane. So each one of these pixels that you see here is some combination of real and imaginary coming out of my voice right now. And whereas that's interesting enough, we really don't want to see this. We want to see what's beyond this. This is a temporal domain uh, example of what I'm saying right now. What I really want to see is I want to see what is a spectral domain? What does this look like on the other side? in that absolute world that we were talking about earlier. So to do that, we take this, this, um, this mask right here and we turn it into a diffraction grating, like a filter, and we shine a pure white light through it and then put a screen on the other side and we would get this. And we call this the spectral essence of a person. And this is basically the pattern of the sound that you're hearing right now. So this is why we call it quantum biofeedback because what you're looking at right now is a pattern that was created before I actually, this is the pattern that's made in my brain 
before the sound actually is coming out of my mouth. So we're looking at it kind of in reverse here. And wow. If, if this was done on a person who had never done any work on themselves, the pencils just randomly distributed. But the more work a person has done on themselves, the more patterns and geometry start showing up. So we can see, uh, you can see all these different colors here. The, the red is more um, correlating to physical, material, tangible things. The green more to mental, emotional things, and the blue more to intangible or spiritual sorts of things. And when those balance each other out, you get white. So you can see a lot of white in there as well, but it's hard to see the white with all the colors, so we have another function in here where I can take the colors out like this. And now I can see everywhere where it's white in there. And um, this would actually represent the parts of myself that don't need any further ordering. This is the parts of myself that are already harmonized together. So there are all kinds of ways of taking this information you can see down here in this corner there's all kind of real-time state of being indicators that let us mathematically look at these these uh, images and we can actually see how much white is there and how much isn't so we can see how harmonic the person is being in the moment what their coherence is what their distribution between real and imaginary and complex is we can see the distribution between physical and mental and spiritual we can see um, the uh, range of their frequencies. We can see their fundamental frequencies and what music notes those are. We can see where they're at in what we call the manifestation cycle between thinking, expressing, acting, and manifestation. And we can also see how much energy is there and whether or not it's moving out of them into their environment or whether they're being more like a black hole and pulling it all into themselves. So there's a number of different things that we can measure in real time as a person is watching these different images. And um, this uh, it's not really complicated, but it's a little complex. So it'll do a lot of different things. You can see here from the user interface that it'll do a lot of different things that I haven't talked about yet. But uh, it can use either a person's expressions from their voice, or it can use in a headband. We can actually use let allow their thoughts to actually control all of this as well. So generally, to answer your question, what we have a person doing is they are basically uh, lying down um, on um, one of these systems like this. They're lying down here and they're seeing and hearing and feeling their own biofeedback. So that would be projected up here onto the, to the screen. And then the sound feedback goes into the ears and the vibratory feedback goes into the person's body. Okay. And so from, the, from the, from the, the partial example you gave us. Okay. I see. I was just going to show you this is uh, this is my studio here uh, where we actually have this is this is my daughter laying on top of one of these wave tables and I, we can see we create a standing wave by putting a little dolphin over her chest that also vibrates to the sound of the music so it's creating standing waves between the two and then the the images are are projected up here onto the ceiling where their eyes are open or if they close their eyes this other little device takes over here that uh, does the light and sound into their closed eyelids. Okay, so the brain is able to make sense of all of that data and, and use it to, to um, so essentially you're sort of making yourself more coherent in some way by experiencing these um, absolute aspects of yourself that are not yet exactly. integrated. Exactly. And this is an important point because most people really don't realize how little we experience ourselves. I have people come in every day and I ask them to tell me about their best friend. And they can describe every different aspect of this best friend. You have to use adjectives to describe a person's manner of being. You can say that they're happy, they're sad, they're, they're smart, they're excited, they're helpful. You come up with adjectives to describe how they are in the world but you could also describe them from their manner of doing, how they do in the world, what they do with their time, how they treat other people, 
uh, how they treat other people and that sort of thing. So um, people can tell me all about their friends, but when I ask them to do it about themselves, tell me who you are, they'll say something like, hmm, well, let's see, uh, hmm, well, I try to be a good person, uh, and they basically can't do it. Because basically, how, how, many, how much time do we spend actually experiencing ourselves? Hardly any at all. We know a lot about everybody else, but we know very little about ourselves. So when we have a person watching these images like this, uh, their first question is usually, what am I supposed to be doing? And the answer is nothing. You're supposed to be just experiencing yourself. This is like looking into a mirror, but instead of looking at a time domain version of yourself in a mirror, you're looking at a spectral domain version of yourself, who you are on the other side. What are the patterns that make you up? And so just to experience this alone is even way more powerful than analyzing it, watching these images, watching the numbers down here and what all's happening with you. Analyzing yourself isn't nearly as powerful as experiencing yourself. And somehow the brain is able to see these images, hear this sound, the sound representation of this, and feel this, the vibratory nature, the, the tactile version of this, and, and integrate that information. Yes, and gen generally, if they stay with it long enough, that uh, they will ultimately have what we would call an epiphany or an aha moment where they suddenly just get a bigger picture of themselves. It's almost like waking up out of a dream and realizing, oh my gosh, uh, I understand, I get it. And those kind of experiences are more important than anything else that we have found for a person. You can sit and you can watch these images or you can analyze yourself to death. But nothing really changes until you have a moment where you really get it, that, uh, that you acknowledge that I really need to change. And then you have to give up the resistance to the change. And then you have to remove all the unwholesome things that are in the way of keeping the change from occurring. And then you have to have the courage to let go of the old and step out to the new. Most of the people that I work with um, want to be doing something else. They have a job that's providing them with their money, but they'd rather be a sound therapist or some type of, they'd rather do like you do and, and, uh, and have your own business with the yoga and all that sort of thing. They'd rather do that, but they can't because they have this other job that's providing them all their money. And they don't really realize that the way the universe works is it requires dedication to something and it requires courage and trust in it. And so most people will start the new thing and try to keep the new thing going while they keep the old thing going. But the universe doesn't like that because it always gives you an escape pattern. If, you, if something goes wrong in the new thing, you just run back across the bridge to the old thing. So the universe really requires that we burn the bridge to the old way and you step out into the new way. And then it starts, the universe starts supporting you when you make decisions like that. So this technology is all based around trying to help a person reach that state of mind where they have an epiphany or an aha that really does shift them. And then when they get up, when they come off of the, the system or come out of the experience, they're able to go out and actually make that happen in their life acknowledging the need to change and giving up the resistance and removing the unwholesome things in the way and then letting go of the old and stepping out into the new. This is a self-realization sensory feedback system. Exactly. And we've actually proven that by uh, taking it to another level with, uh, with this system here. I can basically take the uh, wires loose from the earphones that the person is listening to the sound feedback come into their ears. I can take those wires loose and bring them back to this uh, system and hook the two wires up to these two 24 karat gold waveguides that are suspended into a chamber filled with water. 
and ask the water to do the same thing that I'm asking the person to do. And with the person, you can't really see what's happening. They're laying there on the bed and they can't really fully transform themselves to their next highest level, which for a human being would be spirit. I haven't really seen that happen yet where a person just disappears off of the table and goes to spirit. But water doesn't have the same, um, it doesn't have the same resistance that the person has. So um, this, what, this is what actually happens to the water when I just play the sound from the voice into these two things where they go rod, the water begins to cavitate and inflate into it on itself and remove all the unwholesomeness, purify itself, and go to its next highest level, which the water is vapor. And then we, uh, we collect the vapor and reconstitute it back into liquid and then bottle it, how the person drinks it, and it turns out being the most profound technology that I've ever created. Wow. So, so <laughs> you're drinking water for self-realization. Exactly. You're just basically drinking something that you're already 70% or more percent of that has already resolved the difference between what the real and the imaginary components of what you're saying or thinking. Wow. I wonder if you could even uh, make that an isotonic solution and IV that. Absolutely. We have a lot of different people doing that. Oh my goodness. And so this is your, this is your lab, right? Yes. This is not something that someone could look up a practitioner uh, directory right. and find someone near them that. Right now there's only two of these exi that exist. One is in my lab here. And w the other one is with our engineer that lives in Glastonbury. I mentioned him to you yesterday. He moved there to uh, put our supercomputer there on the ley lines. I can actually, this is a, this is a, um, just a, a diagram that basically shows our supercomputer and how it's, uh, it has three components. Uh, it's partially digital and partially analog. And the reason we do that is, is because uh, basically what we're talking about here is making models of things. We, we've known since we were in grammar school that we've been taught that to study something, especially a biological phenomenon, you basically have to make a model of it and study the model. And so we're making models of people's consciousness and we're letting them study the model. But digital models are only approximations of the real thing because they've got holes, uh, sampling holes in the digital model. Whereas a perfect analog model of something, a perfect mathematical analog model of something, is more or less the same thing as what you're modeling. So um, we have this supercomputer that basically allows us to look at an analog model of a person. And that's, those are those images that I was showing you there. Those are analog models of my personality. And I mentioned to you yesterday that this device is also hooked up to an autonomous transducer sensor array that is a super duper antenna that can measure the entire vibrational spectrum so that we can actually get a readout on the world grid. So those images that I showed you earlier, like, um, like this one, that can be done from the world using that uh, sensor instead of just an individual person. Well, can you tell us, can you give us a, um, how the earth is doing? <laughs> well, strangely enough, we don't really see anything that would be totally disruptive of things, which to me, it looks like it's all coming apart, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. But when we look at the overall scheme of things, it looks like uh, whoever or whatever is in control of it is definitely in control of it. And it looks like it's, it's smooth going. Wow. So, um, so we have a lot of hope that... Uh, the world is going to pull out of this funk that it's been in for the past number of years and, um, and work out all these problems and become the place we all know that it's capable of becoming. Wow. Don, thank you. This is, this is amazing. So let's, let's get into you and links and stuff. How can people, if they want to 
learn more about your tech. They want to experience it. How do they do that? Uh, let's see if I have, this is the, the webinar that I was mentioning to you that defines all the different parts of the chart. So I actually have taken the chart apart like this and actually can show different segments of it and explain it and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So this will be available within the next two or three weeks to where it's actually a whole training uh, class on vibrational technology. Here's my current information of the, the name of the company, the address, the voice numbers, the email, and that sort of, and the website, and that sort of thing. Uh, 